Um, I want to emphasize that there are many different access paths that exist in database. You can't have a database conference without somebody talking about variations of access paths. You can do everything from only indexing you know, a part of a relation, not, not, not even a whole relation, uh, to having all sorts of different variations. The, there's work about log structure mode trees that I'm not going to get to today, which I briefly discussed um, in another lecture, which is an example of a relatively recent commonly used uh, data structure. This is one that we're going to talk about, spatial data management, just showing you that the world doesn't stop with uh, B trees, and this one is relatively old. The, the work goes back to uh, the, uh, 19, uh, the 1980s, but still really worthwhile for you to know, even if it's not going to be on the, the, the final. Um, before we start, um, well, um, I, I'm going to start with the bottom thing. You, you have the student experience of teaching survey stuff. Uh, which, uh, again, you can fill in until Sunday, the day before finals begin on Monday, and it's uh, the campus-wide evaluations. We can't see who wrote whatever, and even the summary form isn't available until uh, a month after it gets complete. Uh, I'm going to put in a commercial, and I know that there are several teams that got a lot of help even yesterday from RTA, from Saloni, who we know, uh, as it happens, from both 180 and 181. She, she's helped people out enormously. She's really, really, really good. Several of you who are shaking your head yes, I know my <laughs> detailed help from her yesterday. Um, and uh, she, 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 she really is ter terrific. I and you are very fortunate to have had her. Uh, she's a three-time loser. She TA'd 180 for me twice in the fall and winter, and of course 181 this term. So, um, you know, get, get, get your digs in on my bad jokes and, and, and whatever you're <laughs> doing with your teaching uh, as, as you fill in the surveys. But um, I would urge you, assuming that you agree with me, that Saloni is terrific to uh, say uh, terrific things about her. Um, and then there's the final exam, which is on Wednesday in this room from 4 to 7 p.m. You'll obviously be sitting um, you know, separated by one or two seats from each other. At this point, I think you can be separated by two. Um, everything that we've done in the term can be on the final. I sometimes have people asking, they're, they're even asking in 182 this term, what's going to be on the final? The work that we did all the term, including the stuff in the projects and the stuff in the lectures and, and, and so on. No, 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 I won't be asking about any of the jokes, but, but I will be asking about the rest of the material that 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 that, uh, that 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 we've talked about, and for example, you know, in 180, I can't give a short summary of what's on the exam because just about everything in the term gets covered. There are no multiple choice questions. There are some true falses um, on this exam. There are, there are lots of questions on material. We've gone through all the way through the, 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 the term. Uh, you get to bring in a cheat sheet if you want to, as you did on the midterm, and you still have your midterm cheat sheets. I don't think I collected those. Um, and anything that uh, you want can be on them. And you've seen last year's final. There have been a couple of questions about last year's final. Uh, you're welcome to post additional questions on it because there is no answer sheet for it. I don't post the answers for 181, but I am happy to talk with you about any of your questions about the practice final or about any of the material from the lectures or you know, your, 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 your general you know, questions and views about technology. If you post something on Piazza, I'll see what I can do about answering it in a reasonably, uh, in a reasonably timely way so that we go forward on, on that. And before I actually get to the slides, let, let me re-emphasize this. You take a course like this and, and you hear answers from me. And you know what? I mean. One of my favorite people in the world is a good friend of mine who's currently dean of the Computer and Information Sciences uh, group at uh, uh, the department, it's called the college, at uh, U UMass Amherst. Uh, she became uh, 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 dean of that college uh, a little more than a year ago. And um, she also uh, was a manager of mine at IBM as well as, a, a, again, a close friend. She was in charge of all computer science at IBM Almaden. She actually was the person who had oversight of the research at IBM uh, for, for quite a while. And she wore a badge all the time, I think she still does, um, which says question authority. And, and she's the authority in, in many cases, and she wants to be questioned. 
So I've given you what I hope is useful information about stuff during the term, but everything changes. Viewing all the stuff having to do with data management, and it's more than just database management, there's a whole lot of stuff that isn't managed in databases. Viewing data management as a fixed area where there are fixed answers is a recipe for becoming useless because the field keeps changing, the hardware keeps changing, the applications keep changing, the size of the data and the variety of the data uh, keep, keep, keeps changing, the algorithms that people come up with keep changing, the notions of what constitutes sufficient consistency for the data, as I've mentioned all through the term, keep changing. So yeah, you should take advantage of everything that I said and ignore it where appropriate. And it will often be appropriate to ignore it. So these are principles, guidelines that you should think about in, 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 in looking at where the technology is, but they're not inscribed in stone tablets. And even if they were, sometimes you should be iconoclast and cast down the stone tablets. Um, so I mean, I, that's what iconoclast actually means. Um, so, so, so take, I mean, there's useful stuff in this class, a fair amount of it, maybe more than you'd like. But there's also stuff that you should view as something to deviate from where appropriate because it's not always going to be appropriate. So we're going to talk about a particular way of dealing with spatial data, which is different from B-trees. And we'll talk why B-trees aren't the right thing for dealing with it. But there are a lot of other approaches to spatial data that, that are being used now. But we're going to talk about some of the basics. So spatial data, you can have pointer data, such as you know, satellite, satellite imagery with, vector, with the, uh, images about the points, what, what the thing at a location or a set of locations is. There can be feature vectors that you extract, there are all sorts of other vectors that you're dealing with with machine learning. And spatial data can include any kind of multi-dimensional data. It doesn't have to be geography. It doesn't have to be space and time. Any kind of multi-dimensional space that, 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 that you're working with. And there's this abbreviation which was used for a little while and isn't used much anymore with slow, low, low, where you talk about social, local, and mobile data. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you're talking about where, you know, the nice thing about having phones is you can get information based on where you are. The terrible things about it is that all that information ends up getting recorded and analyzed and shared in certain ways that are really scary. I may have mentioned this already about, I don't know, 12, 14, whatever years ago. Scott McNeely, who was the CEO of um, Sun Microsystems when it was founded and for most of the time afterwards, made a comment that there is no privacy, get over it. At the time, that may not have been true. It is now. There's just not that much privacy and the amount of information that we end up giving away without knowing it um, in return for getting free services just ends up being huge. And then there's region data where you can have descriptions of you know, lakes, forests, buildings, uh, people, when you have satellite image, all sorts of things. And databases end up using geometric, you know, approximations of, 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 of the things in these multi-dimensional vectors trying to describe it. You don't necessarily have to get the shape 100% fully. And so with the understanding that when we talk about spatial, it can be any kind of multi-dimensional data, like the stuff you use in machine learning. But here's an example with geography, find all cities that are within 50 miles of Santa Cruz. So there, there is, is a region, and you may want to have, you know, you, depending on how you ask the question, you may want to know the things that are contained within that 50 mile radius, or things that are um, intersecting that 50 mile radius. You can find the 10 cities near Santa Cruz, maybe ordered by proximity. You can also do spatial join queries. Um, so find all cities that are near some lake. Find all cities in California that are within some distance, 10 miles of a lake. Um, and again, that can be kind of expensive because you have to do a join based on, um, you know, cities and lakes that are within 10 miles or whatever it is that you've shown. And there are all kinds of systems that are out there. Um, and if you think about what stuff you view with Google Maps, there's all sorts of stuff. That, 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 that uses notions of, of, of spatial, which, which goes well beyond all the stuff that, 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 that are there. Um, there are also things that are used in design, 
where you can you know look at, at, at design um, of, of, of rooms for real estate or buildings or oil wells. There's a lot of stuff at SAP having to deal with oil well management that had to deal with uh, special stuff, looking at ranges and things that are near each other that have certain properties. This can't be that close to that or whatever. And again, multi-dimensional uh, multimedia databases, again, where you have to be able to you know re retrieve things based on various properties of the stuff that you have inside, including aspects of proximity. So we spent a lot of time talking about one-dimensional data. If you ever read Flatland or Spaceland, you probably should be interested in books about it. Start, 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 start with Flatland. We're, we're um, uh, a, 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 a ancient book, but still fun. And basically, a B tree is one-dimensional. Sorry, B trees, it's really one-dimensional. Even when you go ahead and create something with an index on multiple attributes, like age and salaries, what you're doing is you're linearizing. You're saying age is the major field and salary is the minor field. And so you're going literally, and sort of there's the basic idea that there is you know, an ordering. So you're going to go through all the things that are 11, and then you drop that down, and you go through all the things that are 12, and you drop that down, and you go through all the things that are 13. And that's what's going on inside what, 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 what's going on. So, you know, you can take a look at the various entries, 1180, 1210, 1220, and 1375, and you can talk about whether or not they end up being um, close to each other. And, and, and you know, basically, uh, there's some clustering going on, and you might easily be able to see that the two things that begin with 12 are close to each other, but the two things that are up there at 80 and 75 on the, you know, I'll call it the y-axis, but it's the, the minor field. And, and that they're also close to each other in some sense because they're, 11 and 13 aren't all that different than 80 and 75 aren't all that different. They're close to each other and when you linearize, you don't keep track of that easily. So, you know, I mean, trying to go ahead and recommend things that are similar to each other multi dimensions of products that are similar to each other, people who are similar to each other, all sorts of things going on. And keeping track of this thing when you just have that one dimensional index is hard. You can say these two things are close to each other in the B tree, but you don't say that those two things are close to each other in, 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 in the B tree. It's just not there. So, again, um, uh, you want to be able to have, you know, spatial queries. So we've already mentioned a bunch of examples of this. Find all the cities that lie, lie on the Nile River in, in, in Egypt. Find all the parts of the plain that are touching the fuselage of the plain. Cities with population 500,000 more, um, and find the one that's nearest to uh, Kalamazoo in, 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 uh, in, 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 in Michigan, and why is Michigan, you know, et cetera, to the hotels near a conference venue. Uh, again, find, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in this. In fact, there are a lot of people with, uh, I believe San Francisco has just forbidden uh, the use of, of facial recognition for law enforcement. Find, find the five most similar faces. What does similarity mean and how do you compare? It's a multi-dimensional query based on, you know, uh, some you know, descriptions of what faces are like. Given a customer, find the five most similar customers according to uh, the, the, the buying pattern or, you know, various, uh, uh, basically, the, the stuff that was being done at Walmart where they were working on a genome for people so that you could see, and I don't really mean um, uh, DNA, uh, just uh, you know, descriptions of uh, people out in five, ten, actually a thousand dimensions that they have on people so they can look for similarities of, of, of people. Plus, again, the one that we'll be focusing on is um, a multi dimensional thing involving um, uh, latitude and longitude, but you could also have multi-dimensional in age between 50 and 55 and salary between um, 80 and 90. Again, emphasis, this ain't on the final, but um, it's still very much worth knowing. So you want to have index based on a spatial location, where again, I'm talking about multi-dimensional data. And the stuff that we'll be talking about works really well for two-dimensional, works well, for three-dimensional, starts falling apart a little bit when you get past uh, three dimensions. So, one dimension. Focus on geography with two dimensions relative to longitude. One-dimensional index doesn't help you deal with that easily because you get the things that are alike in the one-dimensional linearization, but not in the multi-dimensional. Uh, Hash is terrific if you have a point query. 
Crashes are not good for range even in one dimension. So that's, that's bad. And as usual, you have all these operations with insert, delete, as well as search that you need to be able to do and, and, and update. And you want to be able to deal not just with points, but also with shapes and lines. And the arc tree is still fairly widely used, but there are a lot of other variations that are used today. Again, the world, the world keeps moving. So what's the notion of an arc tree? Well, <laughs> it's a tree. Um, and again, it stays balanced on inserts and deletes just as a D tree does. And here's the basic idea. When you end up having a shape, you describe it based on a bounding box. If it's two dimensions, a two dimensional rectangle that includes that shape. Sometimes other polygons are used, but rectangles are the easiest. And we will just focus on the rectangle, but other, other shapes are used. Um, so you have a shape that ends up including it. So here's an example over here, and you want to keep track of all the shapes. You have a root, you have a way of finding the various shapes, and all the shapes are included within those bounding rectangles, but you really do care about the details of what's inside or not. So basically, the leaf entry of the R tree is an n-dimensional box, let's say two-dimensional, might be three, and the RID of the data that corresponds to it, let's say something that intersects that particular box, or you might be doing things where you're only keeping track of the things that are contained in the box. If you remember our alternatives one, two, and three, where one, you store the data in the index, two, you have the key value in the RID, and three, you have the key value in a bunch of RID. This, this is basically our alternative two. And you define the box to be as constricting as possible. You're, you're choking the object, the lake that you're containing, or the city you're containing, or whatever it is, as much as possible. And um, in the R tree, we'll come to a variation of it later, um, if there's time. Um, each box in RID appears only once in a leaf page. Well, that's the leaf. What do you have in the things that aren't leaves? You end up again having a n-dimensional box and a pointer to the child nodes, and the, basically the box covers all the boxes in the child node. The child node might be a leaf, or it might be another non-leaf. So it's covering all the things in the whatever is below it, which might be a leaf or a non-leaf. And as usual, to be able to maintain balance, all leaves are the same distance from the from the root, you know, to maintain this log phenomenon. And you try to keep things about 50% full, the same way you would do it for a B tree, um, and see what you can do about it. So it's like an n-dimensional B tree, but with containment. Okay, here's the picture. And here's the thing that's going on. So basically, the things in the green are the leaf entries, and the colored boxes are the non-leaf entries. So you got a purple. I grew up in Brooklyn, we said purple. <laughs> I don't get it now, but anyway. Uh, by the way, I, I grew up in a place in Brooklyn that was called Flatbush. When I moved out here, I lived in Palo Alto initially. A friend of mine asked, how can you live in a place whose name means high tree or tall tree? I explained, I grew up in Flatbush, <laughs> so it's a promotion. Um, um, that has to be at least one more bad joke. And, uh, you can't, can't cap it off without that. Uh, and literally, that's, that's what I said when I asked. Anyway, <laughs> you've got the purple root node. Notice that that's a bounding box that contains everything in it. Question about the joke or about the trick? Uh, about, about the <laughs> 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 Thank you for clarifying. Uh, so is the bounding box, I guess, the boundary, is that enforced by uh, when we first define the attributes? Um, in terms of, for example, if, if it's an int, we have set a boundary. Uh, but what happens for the case of string? Is it possible to get a value that would be outside of the bounding box? When a case of strings? Or, well, I'm just wondering if there's a possibility of you entering a value that would The bounding be box is defined by the smallest box that contains everything that's below it. Oh. So, so, so it's not like the bounding box is a constraint. The bounding box is defined to be the smallest thing that holds things underneath. And again, you can play with lots of variations of that as it works. Um, but, but here, the purple box, you'll notice, it contains a whole bunch of stuff that's every, everything that is in it is in, is in the purple box. And if you then look below, the, you have a bunch of brown boxes. Um, so you've got um, a, a basically a, a situation where you have two brown boxes, which you will notice um, end up uh, not being disjoint. 
but you've got brown box number one, which is this one, and you've got brown box number two, which is that one, and they are not disjoint, right? But everything is contained within one of the brown boxes. So the, 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 the key to the purple box are the two brown boxes. Question? So I was just gonna say, uh, one of the properties of the uh, B plus tree is each individual leaf node has one specific subtree that it's uh, part of. So is that not true here? In this version of it, it is not true here. We will come to another approach, and if there's time, where things only appear in one place. Um, but basically, what goes on is there, there, there's a trade-off here between having it appear in one place and, and the complexity of how some other work gets done with, with, with respect to how, how, how the work happens. We're going to go through this one, and again, if there's time, I'll go through another variation. But And there are many other variations. Question. So I can see how you can make a box in something like a geographic location, but I'm confused about how you do that with something like maybe a string or a, uh, a set of data that has something like purchases and whatnot. Well, we're talking about this, dealing with this with multi-dimensional data where you want to search based on the, on, on the multiple dimensions. And again, if it's two-dimensional data, the same kind of principle can end up being used to be able to search based on the multiple dimensions. And what we're seeing here, again, will work for two, and, and, and for three, it ends up not being quite as successful for more than that. And there are other data structures that are used besides. So we're just looking at something which is really basic here. I'm not talking about strings. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about multidimensional data. And again, focusing more on the two-dimensional, more, more than anything else, which is what this is good for. But there are a lot of other data structures for multidimensional data besides this. Okay, so this, this ends up working neatly, particularly, again, for the simple two-dimensional data. Um, if I have, you know, age and salary, I could do the same kind of thing. The fact that it's longitude and latitude, um, you know, has some nice properties, but I could do it with age and salary just as well. So again, the, the brown boxes are not disjoint. Um, and uh, also, um, one, one of the things that you'll notice is that, you know, part of um, R12 is in this box and part of R12 is not. So we're, we're looking at things where there you know, may be some intersections with it that, that, that end up going on. And now within the brown boxes, there are green boxes. Little boxes on the hillside. Little boxes where the happy tree. The green boxes, and there are a bunch of different green boxes. Here's a green box. And each of the green boxes is entirely within one brown box. So all, all, all of that ends up working. You'll notice that this green box is entirely within that brown box, but not entirely within this other brown box. Um, and so you see how the thing ends up going. And some of the green boxes may end up intersecting with each other. Because you could have cities and you could have lakes. The lake might be partially within one city, partially in another, and you know, not take up the entire, usually lakes don't take up entire cities. Uh, and you see the idea of, of, of what's going on. And the green boxes are things that are the leaves. They're, they, they, they're values that appear in the leaves. They are data entries in the leaves. And here you have an example for you know, R8, which is one of the data entries. And what's the banana? What's the yellow that's sitting inside the green box? That, that's the actual lake that you're looking at. And so you drew a bounding box that contained that banana, lake banana. But what you care about isn't the bounding box, you care about the link. So you have a description associated with that data of, of, of what, what it actually looks like, and it's approximated by the bounding box already. So that, that's the general idea of what's going on. And here's the tree. So you end up having the root, and you've got R1 and R2 within it. Notice that R1 and R2 are the brown boxes. They're the descendants of the root. So in the root, you have pointers to R1, R2, and um, R1 and R2 point to their kids who are down below. So here you've got the bounding box, the, the, the thing with R3, R4, R5. Well, you know, and, and, and again, that's, uh, that's the thing where you end up having the, uh, the, the, the green boxes. And within the, 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 those, you end up having the individual leaves that are, that are, that are, that are associated with it. So it's a tree just like everything else that you have, okay? So, so the, the, the leaves in, the, the, the data entries in the leaves are R8 through R19 
Well, just numbering, and again, there's no reason why they have to be consecutive. These are just names that correspond to the previous slide, and things can end up getting entered, and you're trying to keep everything half full, and that's the way everything works. So here it is, you've got a tree, as, as usual, growing it upside down. So suppose that you want to do a search, and again, we're assuming you're looking for the things that overlap, 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 Overlapping, overlapping trees leaves branches. We're looking for overlapping, not overlapping. Um, you're looking for objects that overlap, overlap a box Q. And what do you do? You start off as usual at the root, and you basically, if the current node isn't a leaf, then you see whether or not you know a particular box. Remember, if it's, it's a non-leaf, you've got you know values E and a pointer where E is a box, a boundary box. And you see whether or not E overlaps Q, which tends to be a fairly fast thing to be able to tell. It's very easy to do two-dimensional. It's not hard to do multi-dimensionally. And, and uh, basically, you, you, you find, uh, you know, uh, you're going to search the subtree, which is identified by, you know, that particular pointer. Okay. And um, if the current node is a leaf, then for each entry, which is going to be in the form E and RID, if E overlaps Q, then RID identifies an object that might intersect Q. It doesn't have to. It might, but it might not, because it is a bounding box. Let's go back to Lake Banana. If the query that I was asking, we're going to come more to this, asked about this area, so we're looking about this, this, this area. That looks like it intersects R8. It does intersect R8, but it doesn't intersect Lake Banana. Right? The query could end up having something where you're looking for things that intersect. Um, and, and again, your box intersects R8, but it doesn't intersect Lake Banana. And in fact, there it is. Okay, so if that's the query, Q, it doesn't intersect Lake Banana, even though it intersects R8. So you're not going to return like banana because our your query doesn't intersect like banana. Go back to this slide. You may have to search multiple subtrees at each level. Unlike in a B tree where there can be only one if you go down, there may be multiple things that you have that can end up um, uh, intersecting the thing that you're searching for. So a, a, again, a, a, in the case of um, the, 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 this query, you know, you only have to look inside, um, uh, you know, what, what, one of the subboxes, which is R4. But for example, if I was looking for something, we're looking for everything that intersected a box that I drew, draw over here, I'd have to look at both ground boxes. I'd have to look at both ground boxes, not just one. So unlike in a big tree, where you only have to search once. With the R tree, you may have to search multiple things. And that's one of the things that you get as a result of the way this thing is being done. So again, two things, you may have to search multiple things. And also, just because something appears to be in the answer based on the bounding boxes, it doesn't necessarily appear in the answer because the banana doesn't intersect Q. So we can go ahead and see how a Search ends up working. Here's our Q. We start off with Q. We start off at the beginning. We see that Q ends up only intersecting R1. It doesn't intersect the, the second brown box. And we take a look at Q, 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 Q and the things within, within R1. Um, and in this case, again, the only thing that it's going to intersect with is R3. And we see that it ends up intersecting down below with respect to R8. But again, that doesn't prove that Lake Banana intersects with what we're looking at, in fact, it doesn't. So just because we found that the only match was R8, that doesn't prove that there is a match. You have to take a look at the actual shape of the thing that has been bounded by the box to figure it out, and that's not that hard a, a geometric thing to do, depending on how the description of Lake Banana works. But we're not going to get into, 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 into the details of how we do that, that, that example one. And in this particular case, it doesn't intersect Lake Banana. Okay, so let's suppose that we have a different query. Query shown in red. And let's see how the search is going to end up working in 
this particular case, and you should get the idea of how the thing is, is, is going to end up working, because there are going to be multiple things that you have to search that intersect in this particular case. So we start off with the query at, going at the top, and we see what we can do, because it's in, it basically it's, it's uh, going to be inside um, R2, and we see that we're going to have to look at both R6 and R7, and we're going to see that there are potential matches in R15, R16, and also R17, R18, and R19. So there are multiple things that we need to be able to check out to see whether or not the thing ends up working. Okay, so this ends up um, be, being something that we, 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 we work with. And, and again, uh, there will be intersections with 15, 16, but when we check 17, 18, 19, it's not going to intersect 17 and 19. It, it, it's only going to end up intersecting 18. So basically, it is. Okay. The reason boxes are used is you don't have to have a whole lot of data to represent a box. Basically, you intersect one corner of the, you store one corner of the box, you store the other corner of the box, bang, you've got the box. Right, so just four values. You know, or you don't have to store all four corners because it is being stored as a rectangle. Well, another possibility is to store triangles, pentagons, heptagons, octagons, Choose whatever shape you want, and that would end up having the advantage that you would minimize unnecessary overlap right, by, by having a closer, tighter shape describing it at the cost of having to do a more complicated comparison to see what's in there. What the heck? You don't even have to have convex polygons. What does convex mean? It means that if you draw a line between any two points in the region, it's also going to be inside the region. Okay, so so that most that, that, that that's all that that, that that convex means. So for example, if you took the letter M and drew a line on the bottom and filled in that shape. So you take an M and you fill in a line on the bottom and you fill everything in that's inside that. That's not going to be convex because you know to draw a line between the top part of the M to the other top part of the M. That, that line is not entirely within the M shape that you drew, so it's not convex. So con con convex ends up being nice. You could have more complicated, but I mean, the choice as to what shapes to use is, is, is up to you. Or you could also go ahead and draw shapes as being unions of convex polygons. There are all kinds of things you can do on this. Um, how do you do insertions? Bring a little multi tree so you're going to see how this thing works. It's going to be a variation. What the heck? You have to build a new tree. So you want to insert an entry with being a pointer. You start at the root as usual, and you try to find the best fit leaf L. So basically, you don't have to put it in multiple places. You can, but you don't have to. We're going to be putting it in one place. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to see what we can do about finding the best fit leaf. We're going to see if we can find the child whose box needs the least enlargement to be able to put this new guy, B comma a pointer in, B is a box, B is pointer is the RID. We're, we're seeing what we can do about putting that in. So we don't have to put it into 17 different places. We'll, we'll, we'll put it in one place. The search is gonna find it. And we wanna find the thing where, we, we try to keep boxes as small as possible because it means that you know we don't have you know, unnecessary searches to you know unless we have to search multiple things if there's a potential uh, thing. So you can find the best leaf, best fit leaf L, and maybe that ends up having space. And if it doesn't, what do you do? You split, and you have to adjust the parent as usual. The children cause trouble with the parent when they split or or merge. Um, so you split the, the 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 child, and you put another entry in the parent. Um, and of course, that might cause the parent to split, um, as, as, as we're seeing with the So that's a general idea of how an insert works. Okay? So when you end up splitting the node, the entries in the node plus the you know, newly uh, uh, inserted have to be distributed between the two kids. So you're splitting L into L1 and L2, or it might be just L and L2, but here I'm writing L1 and L2. Uh, and what you want to be able to do is to, and re remember that this, this is a split that you could be doing at a non-leaf 
And what you want to be able to do is to minimize the combined areas of L1 and L2. Okay, so you know you want to redistribute so you minimize the total area. They can have an A, 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 A intersection. Um, and a good split that you would have in this particular case where we've got four green boxes. And a good split would be, for example, to have that red box and that red box because it minimizes the total area of L1 plus L2. And searching through all the possibilities is complicated. There are various solutions for doing it. The original Whitman paper on this has you know, some ways that uh, you can do uh, to, to, to be able to have a, 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 a good split. The red boxes would be a good split. The more obvious thing that you think of is the two green boxes. That's a terrible split. That's a much worse in terms of the overall area than the two red boxes. So the good split would be the red boxes rather than the, uh, the olive green boxes that are, that are shown there. Okay, so again, we'll see about trying to do an insert. R20 is coming, again, no reason why these have to be consecutive, it's just, it's easy to give the example. You're gonna see what ends up happening when you put R20 inside the tree. So here comes R20, you wanna be able to put it in, you wanna see where it goes. We're gonna see what we can do about putting it inside, um, you know, R4. And in this particular case, it's easy. Because there was one. That worked nicely. I'm not gonna show you an example about what happens when there isn't room. It's the same thing we did with B-trees, except again, the principle is try to put it in the thing where, put it into the leaf that, uh, you know, where, where, everywhere we go, we try to minimize what the effect is. You don't have to put it into two places. You're gonna be searching multiple places, so you only have to put it in one place. I'm gonna say that again, and you should get a clue as to what the variation we're gonna to come to does. You only have to put it in one place because you're gonna be searching every place that might intersect. I'll give you another sentence. If you put things in multiple places, then you only have to search following one path. So what we've done is we've put it in one place so we have to be searching along multiple places that might intersect. If instead you did something where you put it into multiple places, then you only have to search once. So, here we come. There is an example of something called an R-star tree. Nothing happened to me with the IBM R-star project. And basically, it ends up doing a variation. Um, it does something with force reinsert. So when basically, Here's the approach. When a node overflows and there isn't enough room with it, what you do is you'll take some percentage of the entries and you'll see about making things better. So what, what you'll do is you'll reinsert those entries, 30% of the entries into the tree. And what that might do is put things in better places as the tree has evolved so you end up avoiding the, 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 the split. And um, that approach uh, focuses on reducing perimeter rather than area. And now, I said we were about to go to the other approach. The R-star tree, again, is, is a variation where you try to avoid having to do splits by basically saying, let's redo part of what we entered and see if we can make it better so we don't have to do a split. But then there's the R-plus tree. And the R-plus tree is the thing that I mentioned. It avoids overlap by putting objects into multiple leaves if necessary. And what that does is it means you never have to search multiple places. Basically, put what you're looking for everywhere you might find it, which means you can follow any path down. Searches can follow a single path because 